On a good day, you're... On a good day, your focus flitters from 10 minutes of deep, undistracted work to three hours of scrolling on your phone whenever the uncomfortable sensation of boredom kicks in. But what if I told you you could adopt four easy to implement strategies which would make you indistractable, otherwise known as being as rare as a three-legged frog who lays golden eggs in a world where no one can focus for more than 10 minutes? Would you click off? or would you stay and watch the video? If you voted yes for the latter, here's what we're gonna do with the next few minutes of your time. We're gonna fully outline the groundbreaking lessons from Nir Eyal's book, Indistractable. We'll cover exactly what it means to be indistractable, why it's important, and then we'll finish by covering the four ways you can instantly harness this godly life skill. <sighs> so let's go. In Greek mythology, there's a story of a man who was perpetually distracted. In modern language, we call something desirable, tantalizing, after his name. Tantalus. Tantalus was banished to the underworld by Zeus, his father, as a punishment. For what? I don't know. Probably throwing lightning bolts at people. And in the underworld, he found himself struggling in a pool of water while a branch of ripe fruit dangled above his head. Tantalus's curse was whenever he reached up to grab the fruit above him, the branch moved away, always just out of reach. And when he bent down to drink the water to quench his thirst, it always receded. So Tantalus's curse was to always yearn for things he wanted but could never fulfill. But the moral of the story is Tantalus could have realized he didn't need those things in the first place. In fact, he only wanted to grab for these things because he wanted to release himself from the tension of desire and the uncomfortable sensations that this caused. So, being indistractable means you don't get distracted. Surely there's more. In more detail, it means three things. It means you understand the nature of how distractions work and how to avoid them by putting safeguards in place and working with your psychology. It involves adopting radical responsibility towards the nature of how you get distracted, not blaming technology for the reason you get distracted. And lastly, it means you understand all human behavior is motivated to avoid discomfort. And at the root of our distractions are negative sensations we want to escape from. Point two is crucial, not blaming the technology, because blaming your smartphone for the reason why you get distracted is just like blaming a pedometer for making people climb too many stairs. But how can we define distraction? And what is its opposite? I'm going to assume you clicked on this video because you get distracted. Okay, well, let me ask you something. <clears throat> What are you getting distracted from? You may or may not have conjured up an answer to that question, but if you did, I would put money on it being vague. Don't want to at you here, but let me explain. For example, when most people say, I'm getting distracted, just ask them, okay, what are you getting distracted from? And they'll usually say something vague, like, oh, I'm getting distracted from working or from studying. But working or studying is about as broad as your nan's biscuit collection, because they fail to signify the exact task that that person needs to do. But if they had said, I'm getting distracted from reading chapter one from my psychology textbook and taking notes in order to prepare for an exam, that would have been a lot better. So distractions are actions that move us away from what we really want, and the opposite is traction. Now traction is actions that move us towards what we really want. Keep this in mind when we go through the rest of the video. But now, for the juicy details. Firstly, you need to discover what your distractions actually are and when throughout your waking hours you're getting distracted. Do so by filling out the distractions tracker over the next week with two questions in mind. When in my schedule did I do what I said I would do and when did I get distracted? Are there changes I can make to my calendar that will give me the time I need to better express my values? Then there are three steps to uncovering your distractions. First of all, look for the emotion preceding the distraction. Number two, write down the internal trigger. Number three, explore the negative sensation with curiosity instead of contempt. Then when you've got a list of all of the triggers which pull you in the direction of distraction over the course of a week, ask, is this trigger serving me or am I serving it? Leading us into point number two. If you've spent any time within the YouTube productivity space, you've probably been recommended time blocking. And there's a reason it works. If you're unsure about what this is, time blocking is where you turn your values into time. You fill out an hour by hour schedule of how you'd like to spend your life. Time blocking is great because it's the only way to tell if or when you're getting distracted. For example, between midday and 2 p.m. every single day, I learn. That's my two hour window. And if I'm doing anything else during that time, like combing my hair or then I know I'm getting distracted. To cite this analogy again, as we've mentioned it in previous videos, approach building your schedule like a curious scientist rather than an angry drill sergeant. Review the schedule regularly, but there is one rule. 
you must commit to it once you've set it. Otherwise it's useless because the integral point is doing what you said you would. Not only is it important to prove our integrity to other people and live in line with what we say we're gonna do, it's also incredibly important for our mental health to prove it to ourselves as well. There's nothing worse than a liar, most of all lying to yourself. To figure out how to spend your time, go through your values and turn them into activities. For example, if you value discipline, playfulness and focus, you could spend one hour a day exercising, three hours a day doing deep work, and then every night between six and seven you go to a dance class to dance salsa. But time blocking only solves half the issue. Because if we don't know how to manage our uncomfortable triggers when they arise, we're done for. So let's get into the psychology. There are two things which distract us. One, internal triggers, and two, external triggers. An internal trigger is something that arises within you, such as an emotion or a thought, like boredom, stress, fatigue, confusion. External triggers are of course things that happen outside of our internal focus, such as notifications, your phone, or your YouTube homepage. But luckily for us, the author in the book highlights four ways we can manage these internal or external triggers. Number one, surf the urge. Imagine you're studying, but you hit a wall, and you want to distract yourself from the uncomfortable sensations of not understanding the material in front of you by scrolling on YouTube. First, become aware of the urge. Second, do not tell yourself you cannot indulge it. Instead, tell yourself you can scroll, but in 10 minutes time. Then, set a timer for 10 minutes, and if 10 minutes passes and you still wanna scroll, allow yourself to do so. But more often than not, you'll realize that the intensity of the impulse will dissipate within that 10 minutes. Let the first impulse pass, wait for the second. Two, save interesting content for later. Set a time throughout the day where you will allow yourself to scroll. For example, for me, I can't scroll before 6 p.m but I cannot scroll after 8 p.m. And throughout the day, if you notice somehow, because you're not meant to be scrolling, that there's something interesting that you want to watch, save it into your watch later folder in YouTube or whatever Instagram or those apps offer you to do. Three, managing group chats. If you're frequently distracted by the group chats you're in and you realize most of the messages in there are just pure waffle, apply the Napoleon principle. So Napoleon was notorious for not responding to non-urgent emails until a few weeks had passed because he had realized that when he gave the problem some time to breathe, most of the time they solved themselves. So allow your group chats some time to breathe and realize you don't always have to be so active in them. Four, fulfill your needs. Lastly, if you're overusing technology instead of doing other things, it might mean you have some unfulfilled needs in your life. To explain, the professors Richard Ryan and Edward Dietschy are some of the most cited researchers when it comes to the research on what drives human behavior. In the mid 1980s, they came up with their self-determination theory which proposes in the same way as the human body needs certain micronutrients and macronutrients in order to survive, so too our psyche needs three things in order to flourish. Autonomy, competence, and relatedness. When the body is starved, it elicits hunger pangs. When the psyche is undernourished, it produces anxiety, restlessness, and other symptoms that something is missing. This is also referred to as the need density hypothesis. Essentially, the more you're not getting your needs satisfied in your day-to-day -day life, the more you'll seek virtual realities in order to fulfill them. So, if you're watching one too many girlfriend boyfriend videos on YouTube, it's probably time to start dating. Or if you're compulsively watching videos of people master things, then probably means you're not feeling competent in one area of your life. Just an idea. Finally, Use the psychological tool of reappraisal to reinterpret uncomfortable triggers. In my experience since reading this book, this has changed my life. Here's a brief explanation and how to. When a trigger arises, be it internal or external, we can either upregulate it or downregulate it. If we upregulate it by paying more attention to it or seeing it as desirable, its intensity will increase. But if we downregulate it by choosing to ignore it or just seeing it as something undesirable, then its intensity will decrease. So in order to focus and not get distracted, you must desire whatever it is you're currently doing over the multiplicity of triggers that could arise to distract you from what you're doing. For example, imagine you're reading a book but the material is difficult, so you feel the internal triggers of confusion and anxiety which lead to the external triggers of wanting to get your phone out and scroll social media. But you view scrolling as psychologically toxic and leading to a distracted mind. But you view reading as a way to become stronger, wiser, more articulate and wealthier. Suddenly, when you're weighing up whether to 
answer the external trigger or continue reading, it becomes quite clear what you should do. So when we imagine hard things as fun and desirable, novelty and new challenges appear. Personally, the more I reinterpret writing, which is an incredibly hard task to do sometimes, or reading hard material was not only fun, but deeply contributing to my well-being and progress in life, the external triggers which call to distract me just disappear. So, in summary, being indistractable means you take responsibility for your distractions and you safeguard your time to prevent distractions. Distraction moves you away from a task whereas traction moves you towards it. To become indistractable, use a distraction tracker to note where and when you're currently getting distracted. Remember, with curiosity, not judgment. Schedule your time with time blocking by turning your values into time. The one rule of time blocking, you have to do whatever you've set yourself to do. Disarm uncomfortable triggers by surfing the earth for 10 minutes, save interesting content for later at a set time, manage your group chats by letting them breathe and fulfill your unmet needs in real life. Lastly, reimagine hard things as fun through downregulation of distractions and upregulation of the important work. As a little bonus, because these are from the book as well and I didn't really know where to include them, here are four bonus tips you can use to further safeguard your focus and prevent distraction. You can use pre-commitments, setting up certain rewards and sanctions for your behavior ahead of time. Two, you can use social commitments. You can publicly announce what you want to do so other people will hold you accountable. You can use temptation bundling. Stack an enjoyable activity onto or after another. For example, you can only listen to music after you study for 45 minutes and lastly token economy. Assign a value to a poker chip and give yourself one every time you complete a desired behavior. For example one token could mean one episode of something to watch on Netflix. If you're not indistractable after that good luck. I don't know what to say really if you, that doesn't help. A few things. School community is dropping on the 15th. It's going to be good. The Rising Man Academy. Cannot wait to see you there. Otherwise, you know the deal. Stay disciplined, playful, and a little bit dangerous. Adios, muchachos.